All right, all right, let's get started. Really excited about tonight's topic. Again, hang tight afterwards. We're giving away a book. You don't want to miss that. And also really quick, just in case I forget, Brother Izzy Gary will be teaching next week on altar work. We're really excited about that topic uh, next week at 7.30. Uh, not at 7.45 like today, but at 7.30 p.m. We're hoping to see everyone and, and invite someone. Invite someone. All these Bible studies that we're having, continue to invite. Amen. We're going to be talking a little bit about that today. And then, and then uh, we'll talk more about it later. All right, here we go. And like always, if you guys have uh, anything you'd like to add or share, please unmute your mics and let your voices be heard. We're going to be talking about a very exciting topic, a couple of pillars that hold up the church. I mean, the church is built upon the solid foundation, which is Jesus. Amen. How many know that? Amen. Amen. Our lives, the structure of our lives. Anytime you have a structure, it needs to be built upon a solid foundation. We've talked about, we had a Bible class topic months ago, maybe even a year ago uh, on, on a foundation. But anytime you build a solid structure or want to build a solid structure, you're not going to build it upon uh, uh, sand, right? You're going to build it upon a rock or a solid foundation. And that that's foundation is Jesus, right? Uh, right? The Bible says, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we believe that, right? That's what the word of God says. And so here, when we talk about the, the church being built upon two pillars or or, or there are two pillars uh, that are kind of holding the church up, I'll get to that in just a bit. But we remember that these pillars and the church are founded upon Jesus, all right? And this is nothing new. We're going to be talking about evangelism and discipleship and how they're so important and how they go hand in hand uh, together. Not only are they both important, but but they're they're always joined together or they should be because you can have one and not the other and then and then not the other but one you know but they're both required and, and we should have them both <clears throat> so evangelism we're going to talk about that first evangelism we, we think of an evangelist we think of um all you know all these preachers and, and rightfully so you know going and 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 but what are they doing with their when they're going from church to church they're doing something specific right? And then they are evangelists, but we are also evangelistic in a way, and we're going to talk about that. So evangelism, really quick, is a definition, uh, strong concordance. This is the bringer of good news. So an evangelist is a bringer of good news or good tidings, right? And there's another definition. This is the spreading of the Christian gospel, right? The gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, right? The spreading of that gospel by public preaching, or personal witness. So we're going to use that definition uh, just a little bit today. So remember that. So so um, being evangelistic or an evangelist, right? You're you're spreading the gospel of the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus by the public preaching or personal witness. So remember that personal witness is really important too. So by the preaching, teaching, sharing, spreading of the gospel of Jesus, the good news, the good tidings, and by personal witness, you know the power. The power of a witness is undeniable. It's so important. And Pastor touched on this, uh, um, I think, um, this last Sunday, or no, this last Tuesday, and the power of a witness, right? Acts 1 and 8. We're talking a little bit about that today. But the power of a witness is undeniable. You know, it's very, very, very important. Let me admit this person here. You know, sometimes no words are needed at all. You know, just the outward change of a man which is the manifestation of what is going on on the inside, amen, right? Uh, what, what is going on on the inside it manifests itself outwardly, right? And someone says there's something different about that person. Sometimes the good news that we bring to people, hey, I'm bringing you the good news, isn't a verbal bringing, you know, we're not saying, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the gospel. Sometimes it's not a verbal bringing to that person, you know, let me let me let me show you. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, right? This is a very very uh, popular story and example of this. Uh, um, and it's not always a verbal witness uh, that we can be. In the book of Acts, after the lame man was healed, remember that the lame man, uh, uh, Acts chapter three. The Bible says that Peter grabbed him by the right hand, right, and, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. What does it say after this? It says, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God as well. He was an instant 
evangelist in a way, if we're using that definition that we used earlier of public preaching or personal witness, right? So he instantly became a personal witness of the goodness, of the miracle working power of Jesus, a personal wit witness instantly because of that miracle, right? You know, he didn't have to say one word, even though the Bible says that he was praising God. Just uh, initially when he walked, you know, he started, he rose up and his feet began, got strength and his ankle uh, bones received strength. Just that, that rising up and leaping and walking, bam, people saw that, right? He didn't need to say a word, but he began praising God, right? Not, not even caring what, it, what, anyone, what anyone else was looking or thinking, you know, instant evangelist right here. You know, scripture continues and it says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Well, there you go. You know, he attracted the attention, right? The, the, the attention that he was, uh, you know, leaping and walking and praising God. So they all saw him. You know, I'm sure Peter and John rejoiced as well. You know, they were probably, I mean, I'm sure they were worshiping, praising God. Hey, thank you, God, for what you've done. Kind of like what we do, you know, when we rejoice when someone has their miracle, you know, but they were just a channel through which the healing power of the Holy Ghost and the name Jesus flowed through, right? They weren't the recipient, you know, all eyes were on the recipient, the guy walking and leaping and praising God. This right here is why it's so important that we show forth the praises of him, like the Bible says in Second Peter, you know, show forth the praises of him, you know, that when, that when, when God does something for us, we immediately begin to rejoice and worship him inwardly, right? We're excited, but it's, it manifests itself outwardly, right? And not just because he's done something good for us, right? The Bible says in Psalms 150, let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. So we are obligated to worship and praise God because he is God, because he's given us breath in his lungs. But, but it says worship him, right? Praise him according to his excellent greatness, right? There's other reasons we got to praise and worship God, but when he does something for us, right? Even more so, we got to make sure that we let it be known. And that's what he was doing right here, you know? So it was very visible. He became a witness immediately without even being a verbal witness. Hey, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. You know, that wasn't the case. He leaped up and walked and ran and shouted, praising God, you know, and, and we think about inside of the church, right? So that's, that's visible. You know, you see something going on in someone's life. Think about visibly inside of a church, you know, there, there are two types of people who are very noticeable in church, right? Those, and, and, uh, those who are on fire for God, very noticeable, and those who are cold or in, and in, indifferent, right? And, and it's not to pick on anybody, but it's just, it's, it's noticeable. It's very visible. You know, these individuals, these two individuals are juxtaposed. They're contrasting, but talked about closely when we talk about them, they're paired to closely together right the cold and those that are on fire you know they're contrasting but but they're juxtaposed i mean they're they, they're talked about you know together in a way you know you may be able to spot someone who's stuck in the middle you know lukewarm but it's much easier to identify these type of people who are on fire and those who are cold i say that because when a visitor walks into a service right? And the spirit of God is moving, you know, are their eyes drawn to the cold person who's just standing there? A visitor walks in for the first time or the second, third time, fifth time, you know, or are their eyes drawn to the previously lame man or the woman, you know, or man that, that's running the aisles, leaping, shouting, praising God for what God has done in their lives, you know, and I think we know the answer to that, right? They're, they're drawn to that individual, you know, the, the individual that's busy glorifying God, but also they're witnessing at the same time. That person that's running the aisles, that, that's shouting, that doesn't care what's going on, they're being a witness. They're testifying of the goodness of Jesus without even trying to. They're not saying, well, I'm going to do this right now because I'm going to testify and witness of Jesus. We're, we're just thankful. Amen. But they see that. They're like, well, there's something different about that person. You know, the, the visitor might say, wow, I want what they have. We're not going to look over the person that's standing and say, well, I want what they have. No, no. I, I, man, I wonder what that guy's story is. I wonder what that lady's story is. You know, the power of a witness is one of the greatest evangelistic tools that we have. You know, and sometimes we don't even have to try to be a witness. We just are, right? Acts 1 and 8. You know, you might have people come up to you and ask, you know, what church do you go to? 
right? You you have been witness to them, but you are witnessing non-verbally, just in, in the presence that you have, right? The Holy Ghost manifesting itself outwardly, right? What church do you go to? You know, there's something different about you. I know this happens all the time when we go out to eat or just at work or, or, or you know, just different ways. You know, God is using us through the spirit within us to draw man, right? Jesus said that no man come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him. Jesus does the drawing. But if we have the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus, right? God's spirit, then we can be used through God. To draw man as well, the, the spirit will draw, you know, not in and, and of ourselves alone, but through the spirit. Amen. You know, the Bible continues in, in Acts chapter three with the layman, and it says, and they knew that it was he, they knew that it was he, which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. People know the old you, and they knew that it was him who was lame. That's what it's saying. People will know the old you. They know how you used to be, you know, they, they knew you, you were once lame or, or how down in despair we might've been, you know, but when God gets a hold of us, right, they notice the change, you know, there was, you know, Hey, I know who, who she is, you know, she, she's the one that went through that hard time, you know, that, that divorce, that the turmoil, you know, but look at her now, you know, you know, my goodness, who would even know now that she went through all that stuff, that he went through all that stuff. Amen. That is a testimony to the goodness of Jesus, right? We are a witness. You know, the Bible continues, says, they knew that it was he, and they were all filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him. They, they were filled with wonder and amazement, right? And that's not always a good thing. They're just, I, I, I don't understand what I'm seeing here. I knew the old person that he was, he was lame, but what? He's walking and running and leaping and praising God now. You know, what is this? You know, and, and, the, and the people who see us as being uh, nonverbal witnesses, you know, they won't always understand what's going on with, with you or I. You know, they just know we're not the same person anymore. They may be filled with wonder and amazement, you know, because we're now an instant witness. We're not even trying to be a witness, you know. But this is when they'll come up to us and ask us, hey, what happened to you? You know, I, I thought you were down in despair before. I thought you were going through this really rough time. The last time I saw you, you were walking so much more differently. You talk differently, you know, and this is the moment where we're no longer a silent witness, right? Now the uh, verbal evangelistic part of us will shine through and, and bring them the good news as the, as the definition says that the evangelist should be like, bring them the gospel of Jesus and you'll tell them you know let me tell you about Jesus and then that is your end right so so Acts 1 and 8 you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost to come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me right and this is what it's talking about right so power through the Holy Ghost and power to become a witness instant witness the moment the Holy Ghost has filled us you know and if we think about it you know this is what it's all about right we want to we want to save ourselves right get, you know, find salvation get a relationship with God, become a servant of him. But at the same time, you know, we want to go spread the good news, right? We want to save uh, or be soul winners. Amen. You know, think about our initial step to salvation or towards salvation. You know, it, it began with some type of evangelism, right? Our, our initial steps towards salvation, you know, someone, someone evangelized or they witnessed to us, you know, someone went forth and preach Jesus to us, or taught us Jesus through a, a Bible study, you know, they witnessed to us, they, they invited us to the house of God, you know, think about how our, our beginning started, our, our walk with God, or maybe we were at a Walmart one night, a Sunday night, maybe, you know, and we bumped into brother and sister and so-and-so, you know, who, who were there at, right after a, a mighty move of God in the service, and, and God orchestrated my life in just the way where our paths intersected, you know, God, God is good and God does work like that, you know, and, and in that moment, the good news was shared, you know, how many have experienced something like that, or, or maybe you've been on either end of that, you know, but more than likely we were invited uh, to church by someone who was witnessing to us, you know, that that's pretty likely someone invited us to there, you know, even if we were raised in church, you know, we were still delivered the gospel you know, the message through the preaching of the word.
by someone who is a witness of Jesus, right? By the way they walk, talk, live their life, right? And that's the that's our pastor. It's a preacher, evangelist. You know, so no matter if we are raised in church or not, you know, we were all in need of someone telling us about the good news, right? Whether we're in church or not, someone had to tell us the good news. Amen. And that's could be a Sunday school teacher. It could be a pastor. It could be any preacher, teacher, sharer of the gospel, right? Jesus, this is evangelistic, says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? There it is again, evangelism, going into all the world, preaching, teaching, sharing, witnessing in the way we live, the gospel of Jesus to everyone. This is true evangelism, you know? And, but why do we say that? You know, he told them specifically what to go and do. He said, preach the gospel, right? So anyone who goes and preaches any other gospel or doctrine is not only not a true evangelist, but the Bible says that if any man preach any other gospel, right, other than the gospel ye have received, let him be accursed, right? So if you're, if, if someone's preaching the gospel of Jesus, they're a true evangelist, right? They're preaching good news, the good tidings, the only good news, right? There's no other good news besides the gospel. And this was Paul reminding the Galatians, warning them against false doctrine, you know, because we know there's only one gospel, one doctrine, amen. Jesus began his ministry, right, evangelistically, you know, he, with the following words, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's, that's key right there. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, right, his gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. You know, he says, I've come to preach all these things. You know, I've come to not only tell you about me, but to show you about me, right? The gospel would be shown through his obedience and then completed, you know, and, and eventually it'd be verbally taught to all, but also visibly through witnessing amen acts one and eight again you know, not only can we tell someone about jesus but we can show them jesus in the way we live right however you know there's something very important about what jesus said in this verse of scripture and, and when i said key word right at the beginning you know and does anyone know what that is right what is the key word or words right to deliver such a message you know well, he says right here, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and I am anointed to preach the gospel. We got to have the Holy Ghost. Amen. If we're going to preach and teach this gospel and, and share and proclaim this message, we got to live the life, walk the walk, talk the talk. We got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We got to put this flesh under subjection, right? This outer man, as we talked about a, a few weeks ago, this outer man, that way the Holy Ghost can, can, can break through, right? It's because it's the Holy Ghost that's the enabler, the empower. Um, of this message you know it enables us and empowers us to deliver this message with authority right amen amen so remember the acts 1 and 8 bible says we shall receive power after the holy ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses right powerful so the holy ghost is not only salvific or containing salvific qualities right salvation but it will turn you into automatic witness why is this all so important you know what would happen if we weren't evangelistic? You know, what happens when we aren't spreading the good news of Jesus, you know, both verbally and non-verbally as a silent witness? What happens when we're not doing that? If we aren't reaching the lost and bringing people to church, or at least attempting to, then guess what? We're only having church with ourselves. We're the, we're the only ones going to be here. We're, we're never bringing people to church. We're never being evangelistic and, and witnessing verbally and non-verbally. Then the church is going to remain the, the church with the amount of the, the 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 amount of members that we have now it'll remain that way if we're not soul winning i hope that makes sense you know and if that's the case then years from now after the last ftc church member passes away there will be no one left because we've never won souls i hope that makes sense you know a little dramatic some someone might say you know but there is truth in that we have to win souls Right? We have to fulfill our obligation of going out into all the world, preaching, teaching, sharing, proclaiming Jesus, shouting, leaping, praising God for what he has done, 
just like the layman did, right? We, we, it, it is our obligation. It is our do, duty. And there's lots of, of scriptural support to support this, this evangelism, right? This witnessing the, uh, and spreading of the gospel. We want the church to grow, amen? How many want the church to grow? I want it to grow. You know, but what good does it all do if we win souls as we're supposed to, but we cannot keep them in church? Right? What good is a hundred soul revival if we cannot disciple the new converts, right? And, and they just leave. So what good is it if we're gonna win souls and, and have you know have them filled with the Holy Ghost, but they don't stay if we can't keep them, if we can't disciple them, right? Jesus told Andrew and Simon, come ye after me. We say this verse of scripture all the time, but it's so important, right? In many different ways. But he says, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men make you to become that means they are not yet fishers of men but they will be with time there's a process right they couldn't expect to follow them and say all right i'm ready let me let me win a soul uh, um there's a process i'm going to show you i'm going to disciple you in, during this process and i'll make you to become that you know he didn't just say Come after me and, and you'll figure things out on your own. Just do what I do, even though Jesus is, is a great example. But he says, I'll make you to become. I'm going to teach you. There's teaching involved. You know, Jesus would disciple them. You know, imagine if we got called to a specific job and, and when we got there, no one talked to us or, or encouraged us or taught us the ropes, you know, showed us, um, you know, showed us in there uh, or, or, you know, showed us that, you know, in the way they were living, how we're supposed to be. I guess you can say that, you know, what, what if no one, there was no example, there was no pattern. We still have Jesus, but but how do people see Jesus here on earth? Well, they see him through us, All right? Jesus is the pattern. We follow Jesus, the pattern. So we're following Jesus, then they people see, should see Jesus through us, right? So that, then that happens when we have new converts, right? Well, where's the pattern? Where, 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 who, who do I follow? Well, hey, brother, hey, sis, we're following Jesus, but, but I'm going to show you how Jesus lives in the way I live, right? Again, we're, we're witnessing, you know, <clears throat> what if we had two babies? You know, here's an example, you know, one was left out on his own to fend for itself in the wild. Hey, here, baby, you, you go out and fend, fend for yourself, you know, go get your own food, go clothe yourself and, and, and survive on your own, well, the other baby was nurtured and cared for and taught the yeses and nos of life. Imagine how differently those babies will look as they got older. You know, you'd have one baby looking like a little cave baby, little caveman baby, right? With no structure, doesn't know how to talk. He just babbles, doesn't know how to act around people, prefers to be isolated, right? You're like, hey, baby, come here, you know? And he's like, you know, growling at you. And, and you know, it sounds like a caveman baby. But then you got the other baby you know, who's been socialized, right? Who, who's had others in his life to show him, you know, what a good pattern for living looks like. You know, he has people checking in on him, people counseling him, people, people there for emotional and mental support. Does that sound very familiar? This might be an extreme example, but this is the same thing in the church. You know, just because a visitor comes and receives the gift of the Holy Ghost, does that does not mean that they have everything, boom, all figured out. They got the Holy Ghost, they're good to go, right? And that, that's not the case, right? They just got their foot in the door now. You know, in fact, they probably have way more questions now than they had before, right? We, we see that these hungry souls, like they're, hey, I, man, I love this Holy Ghost. What else is there for me? Hey, you know, I got some answers. Hey, let's get a Bible study, you know, and, and, and you see that hunger, right? You know, they're, they're hungry to know and learn now. You know, they go through their ups and downs. You know, they're not exempt from the onslaught of the enemy, you know, in fact, they're, they're a prime target, right? The, the devil wants to bring them back, right? They've turned away, but the devil wants them to get them to turn back the other way, you know, but think about it. They got the Holy Ghost and that's all they kind of know. Like, man, I was speaking kind of, you know, this weird language. Yeah. Well, let me tell you about that. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you how that's evidence of God dwelling within you now. So you see what we're talking about, that this is this part of the discipling the part of the teaching you know, otherwise they're like, well, no one wants to talk to me here. I got the Holy Ghost saying, I, I kind of know what I felt. It was powerful, but uh, there's nothing really left for me. I'm good to go. I can live with the Holy Ghost out on my own now, out in the wilderness. And that's not the case. You cannot, we cannot survive out in the wilderness, right? There, there's, a, there's nothing good out there. 
but but they don't you know and that's what we're there for they don't know about the fruits of the spirit yet right uh they don't know about holiness and separation uh, of the importance of not looking back as lot's wife did so important right we don't look back you know we can look back to where god has brought us from you know that that's not a problem but if our heart's still back there like lot's wife that was the big problem her heart was still back there you know they don't know the specific standards yet or of a prayer life of faith believing in the unseen they don't know about all that stuff yet like well what do you mean like you know um uh, what do you mean i have to wait for my prayer to be answered i i, I want it right now you know things like that Th these are all things that come with time and the teaching and discipling you know just so just as andrew and simon would become you know with help from jesus and their fellow brethren and, and from experience in general right the experience right experience of life you know, our new converts will also become with help from God and help from their brothers and sisters. That's you and I, you know, but it takes more than just talking about it as we're doing here, right? It takes action. We got we to jump into to action and, and do, right? As the disciples and the apostles all did. And look at the pattern that Jesus gave us for evangelism and discipleship in the book of Acts. We're going to be finishing up here pretty soon. Right, so so Jesus gave us a pan, uh, a pattern for evangelism and discipleship in the book of Acts, chapter two. First, we need the Spirit, very important, right? And and we see Acts chapter two start off with that. You know, we see the Holy Ghost outpouring in the beginning of Acts chapter two, and even before the Acts chapter one and eight, Jesus said, "The Holy Ghost is going. You shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me." So the power in witnessing and 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 sharing the gospel comes from the Holy Ghost. So that's primary. We need the Holy Ghost, right? And we see that the pattern uh, in action now taking place in at the beginning of Acts chapter two. So the Holy Ghost important, right? It's primary. So we see the Holy Ghost outpouring going on. You know, the word was getting out to the general public now, or those who weren't in the upper room about what was going on, right? We remember that, you know, some thought they were drunk, some were confused, some made fun, some were filled with amazement and wonder, you know, so this great move of God was being noised abroad around the area. Many did not understand or know what it was about, you know, but the most important part is that the word was getting out. That's the most important part that, hey, they're hearing about it. Hey, don't you worry if you don't understand. We got you. Let me get, let me tell you what this is, right? you know, noise by, you know, it might be noised abroad in the neighborhood. Hey, that church over there, you know, on Fancher Avenue, you hear about that? You hear that they speak in tongues? You hear that the, God's performing miracles over there? I don't understand that. I'm filled with wonder and amazement. I'm not going to say that, but, but, but they're going to feel that way. Hey, don't worry. I'll explain. I'll explain, right? Um, we see that example quite a bit with, especially with, with Philip and the eunuch, right? <clears throat> so word was getting out. That's very important that the word gets out. You know, same thing happens today. You know, people may not understand miracles, healing taking place, the transformation going on in someone's life. They're confused. Like, you used to be like that, but you're not like this. You used to be like that, but now you're a holy roller. You know, but regardless, we need to get the word out. That's, that's, that's important, right? We need to let it be known. <clears throat> you know, and, and the Bible continues, you know, so, some people mocked, you know, some people said, hey, they're full of the new wine, right? Again, they don't understand what we're going to help them to understand, right? And Peter just did that. A man of God rose up and began to tell him this outpouring of God's spirit has been prophesied for, for centuries. You know, uh, you know, he began, you know, or, or he, he said, you know, this is, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, right? This is that. And he began to evangelize. He began to spread the good news here in Acts chapter 2, right? He, the gospel of Jesus, the death, the burial, the resurrection, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, right? He was being evangelistic right here, spreading the good news publicly, right, as the definition gave us, right? But he was also being a witness as well, too, because he was in the upper room, and he was now, now filled with the Holy Ghost, and it was, it was exuding outwardly, right? He had that boldness, you know, and this is following that definition that I gave earlier about public preaching of the good news or being a personal witness, you know, but the purpose is to bring souls, right? You know, to witness to as many people as possible and to lead them to Jesus, right? To lead them 
to transformation or reconciliation with him. And that's exactly what happened here. The preaching, the word, right, is getting out. The preaching was successful because the Bible says, uh, then they that gladly received his word, they received his word, were baptized. So this is the goal here. Get them to the house of God where the word of God is being preached to them, right? So we're evangelizing, we're being evangelistic, and we're getting them to the house of God where the word is, is, is being preached to them so that they may be hearers of the word and then doers, so they can gladly receive, you know, and then that leads them to water baptism and spirit baptism, amen, you know, but not just one or two people, you know, we're happy with those for, for those one or two people, but we want to have a big revival, right? And amen, it's it's coming, you know, we're okay with the one or the two, but we want to see more than just one or two saved, amen? We want to see a great revival and it's coming, you know, and this, this is what happens right here as the Bible continues and says, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, so a great revival. So not just one or two people gladly received, but 3,000 were added unto them, you know, how many want a 3,000 soul revival, right? We should all be raising our hands. A 3,000 soul revival, you know, it, it can happen, you know. But again, really quickly here, as we finish up, what good is a 3,000 soul revival if we don't disciple them? You know, if we don't lead by example, if, we, if they can't see Jesus through us, they're, they're going to say, I, I could have been that in the world. You know, I thought you were filled with the Holy Ghost. I heard you speaking in tongues the other day, you know, but you're still living like that. Where are the fruits of the spirit that you've been telling me about? You know, so what a good is a 3000 soul revival if we cannot keep them and disciple them? You know, if we don't show them how to fast, if we don't hit the prayer room, you know, if we don't know how to give a Bible study, things we, we need to do to sustain apostolic lifestyle, so to speak. You know, on the other hand, what if all we ever did was disciple but we never evangelized and brought souls to the house of God. You know, I'm flipping it now. Then we'd just be discipling each other. We'd just be teaching ourselves all the time. You know, our church would never grow. And then, like I said earlier, when the last person dies here at FTC, there'd be no more FTC because we never won souls. We discipled, we knew how to teach all this stuff, but we never brought them to the house of God. So if all we did was evangelize, but not disciple, they were, they, they probably wouldn't hang around, you know, very long, you know, it's just, we're just talking evangelism and discipleship, very, very important, you know, but here's where it all comes together in, in the word of God. On the day of Pentecost, you know, we have both evangelism and discipleship. We saw the spreading of the good news by Peter, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus, right? Salvation through Jesus, right? He's, he's, he's evangelizing here. He's pre preaching publicly. We saw souls hearing and receiving the Holy Ghost, being baptized of water and of spirit. But where does the discipling come into play here? Have we seen that yet? You know, we do see it on the very next verse of scripture. It tells us about discipling because it's not enough that we receive the Holy Ghost, be baptized in Jesus' name, repent. Well, what about after that? Same thing applies when, when a new convert comes in. We used to be new converts. What happens after that? Well, you know, we start feeding the sheep. We start being fed the word. We start hearing about standards and holiness and separation, how to live right, clean, holy life. And we see that right here, Acts 2.42. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, teaching, doctrines, teaching, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers, you know, and all that believe were together. They weren't separated, right? They weren't isolated, you know, or every man for himself, but they were together and had all things common, right? That, that, that is awesome right there. And it says, and they can, and they continuing daily. It's an, it's a daily thing serving God, discipleship, learning, reading, prayer. Fat. It's a daily thing, right? Consecration. It's just not Sundays or Tuesdays, but it's a daily thing. So it says, and they continuing daily, right? With one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Did they eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart? right? One mind, and one accord, unity, right? They were together, had all things common, you know, so we have souls being saved through the preaching of the word, and we have the continuing of teaching and discipling of not only the new converts, but also more with the more established saints as well, you know, so God added 3,000 souls, you know, and would use this continued teaching and fellowship, 
breaking of bread and prayers to disciple and keep them. He's saying, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the teaching, right? The teaching doesn't go away after you receive the Holy Ghost. No, we got to continue in it. Amen. Chapter two finishes up right here. We're going to be done in about a few minutes. Chapter two finishes on the next verse of scripture and says that these converts praise God, right? Having all favor with all people. God's people are a favored people. We know that to be true. And the Lord, him alone can do this. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, right? God does the adding, amen? God does the adding. But we, through the Spirit, right? Through the Holy Ghost, which is primary, are responsible for teaching and preaching and discipling of these people who have been added to the church daily or to the body, right? So we got an important role to play in all this, right? What did Paul say? He says, this is, a, this is an example of this teamwork of, of our duties of discipling and, and, and adding to the church, helping God add. God will, will do the saving part, but we got to bring them here. Paul says this, he says, I have planted, Apollos has watered, but God gave the increase. Amen. He says, and he says, he says it to the church at Corinth. You know, we have a major role to play in all this, right? In kingdom building, in evangelizing and, and discipling, right? God gives the increase. We know that we don't give the increase, but we can still water and we can still plant, right? We still need planters and waterers, you know, or we can say maybe pastor is Paul planting the seed of truth in the visitor through the preaching of the word. And then we come in afterwards and begin, you know, to, to, to water, you know, with Bible, with Bible studies, with, with things of that nature, encouragement, fellowship, breaking the bread, right? Encouragement, all that stuff. You know, we, we need a, a planter. We need waterers, right? Who wants to be a planter and a waterer for the kingdom? You know, amen. <clears throat> we can only have one. We need both. And then after we do, we got to get ready because God will begin to give the increase. You know, so not only will we see a great revival, but we will see the church begin to grow. And that's what we want to see, right? We want to see souls saved, brought into the church. We want to see the church grow because we're keeping them. Because their souls being saved, and they will begin to stick and serve God. That is our prayer. That is our goal. You know, we are being leaders in the kingdom of God. We are leading people to church. We're leading people to the foot of the cross, right? We're being fishers of men. We're leading them to Jesus, right? We're telling them, follow me. As I follow Christ, right? As Paul told the church at Corinth, he says, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So we're telling them, follow me as I follow Christ, because Jesus is our pattern. Amen. Someone say amen. Someone say I'm an evangelist. Amen. We're, we're evangelists. I'm an evangelist. Amen. Amen. And not in the context of like, you know, like we, we know Brother Andrew Parks, I think he's still evangelizing, you know, not in the context of that, but but of sharing the good news, right? That is our obligation. That is our duty. But also being a personal witness as the description, the definition gave us. Amen. So we are uh, evangelistic in a way. And, and, and we also are disciplers because we're being discipled by Jesus and the man of God. And, and we can do that in, in, in return. So when we see souls save, they're, they're, we're not just going to see the, this 100 soul revival, but, but you're going to see the church grow at the very same time. How many believe that? I believe it. I believe it. Amen. Amen. Amen.